So we're going to switch to water. Um, I have had uh, uh, the good fortune over um, in the last couple of decades working with many folks who are attending this conference and other colleagues in uh, understanding the dynamics of our streams and rivers in the state of Vermont, bringing um, <clears throat> fluvial geomorphology into our everyday management of our streams and rivers. Um, what really led to a lot of this work was a lot of the uh, increasing uh, damaging flood events that we were seeing uh, in the state of Vermont and a lot of questions being raised about why are we seeing uh, the increased damages that we were. What's exciting to me um, about what I'm going to share with you today is, is really bringing a lot of this science to bear on our, on our understanding of <clears throat> stream and river ecosystems and then connecting um, that uh, whole set of, uh, uh, you know, and discuss, um, excuse me, connecting a lot of that science to our understanding of the broader uh, ecosystems, landscape scale ecosystems. Climate change, or, or what I'm starting to feel like as our climate crisis, makes it so important that we uh, understand, increase our understanding, maintain and restore uh, the natural forms and the natural fluvial processes that create clean, cold, connected, and complex habitats. And we, um, uh, you know, have, like I say, been working to understand uh, the, the importance of these processes that occur. Uh, this this uh, image here really is, has been my decoder ring in trying to understand how our river systems work. Um, if, if you really focus on the, the center pe pendulum of that diagram, you can understand that uh, streams are constantly shifting and moving back and forth between uh, different uh, scour and, and deposition processes. If we uh, increase our uh, sediment load and, and or the roughness of our stream channels, they become they become aggradational. They build up. They, they can't transport their, their, um, their sediment load. Conversely, if we increase the amount of water in our river systems or we increase the power of that flowing water, then we become degradational. Our rivers move down. And <clears throat> what's really important from a habitat standpoint is that rivers are constantly shifting back and forth uh, between these two modes. And, and it's the, com the complexity that we, that's so important in our aquatic ecosystems depends on the constant uh, balance of mass, the water and sediment loads, and the constant balancing uh, of the forces of the river system. And, and <clears throat> these processes uh, as they occur, uh, you know, create that really complex set of uh, 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 aquatic habitat components that we think about. The, the, uh, the, the riffle pool stream that uh, switches back and forth between being depositional and being uh, scour between our, our riffles and our pools, or our steps in our pools r really rely on this constant balancing of power. Humans in the last 200 centuries have really tipped this balance uh, dramatically and, and many of our streams are not in equilibrium. These processes that are so important for creating and maintaining uh, habitat in our systems have been severely tilted. Most of our streams have become scour dominated. We have increased the amount of flow in our rivers. We have, we have straightened our rivers and increased the slope. Uh, and, and, and our streams have become disconnected from our floodplains uh, and they are now, they become uh, scour dominated systems. And so this has decreased the complexity and in many cases uh, decreased the connectivity of, of our stream uh, ecosystems. So that's sort of the, the background, you know, much of the data that I, I mentioned that we collected over the last couple of dec decades has documented that we um, have uh, predominantly scour environments in our 
our ecosystems and our rivers are disconnected. The whole concept of connectivity, though, is, is one that I'm very excited about bringing into uh, our analysis of our river systems, uh, understanding how these processes uh, are occurring throughout the system longitudinally, upstream to downstream, vertically, uh, as it relates to the connectivity of the river flows, the groundwater, and the floodplain wetland ecosystems. Uh, lateral connectivity, the ability of the river to move onto its floodplain uh, during these different flood events, as well as temporal connectivity, the, the natural uh, cycle of flows uh, that we see uh, throughout the, the, the year. All of these different types of connectivity allow us to understand these processes at lo much larger scales. And, and uh, again, because uh, our under, uh, you know, what we now understand to be the condition of our rivers, uh, where they have become uh, scholar dominated, disconnected vertically, and uh, it has, has become uh, really uh, you know, such, such an urgent uh, thing that we need to work on and, and hence, uh, you know, is, is a big part of what this floodplain initiative is going to be all about, is understanding the, these connections that then support these processes. Um, a lot of this information was just talked about in our last slide, but the, um, this is the, 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 the droughts, uh, the intensity of storms, the increase in temperatures, these are all dependent on uh, it, you know, from a, uh, a river ecosystem standpoint on the, this connectivity and the types of equilibrium processes that I mentioned, and they will all be exacerbated uh, by the disconnections that we are currently seeing in our river systems. <clears throat> I've, t you know, I've touched on this, but through, um, through many of the activities that we've seen uh, deforestation resulting in uh, one to two meters of accretion of sediments onto our floodplains, causing our rivers to be disconnected from their floodplains. Uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of uh, river straightening, which has increased the slope of our channels. Uh, so many of the activities, uh, commercial <coughs> uh, dredging of our rivers uh, several decades ago further deepened our rivers. And, and then a lot of the encroachment, the, the, our transportation system is one of the primary um, factors in disconnecting our rivers laterally from their floodplains. Uh, so um, this is where we're starting from, and yet connectivity and, and this equilibrium process, this, this, uh, this dynamic uh, back and forth between depositing and, and uh, or I should say uh, equalizing the, the mass and forces of our river systems is so important uh, in order for us to be able to adapt, uh, for our, these aquatic ecosystems to adapt to climate change. So the functioning floodplain initiative that we are now beginning is going to try to build upon a lot of the, the science that we've worked on over the last couple decades. And we, we, we are going to uh, use a lot of the, the, the types of data, I'm going to go through the types of data that we're going to look at to understand what is connected and what is disconnected in our landscape. Where do we have our, our rivers, are, where are they vertically disconnected uh, from their floodplains? How much lateral space is, remains in our river systems in order to uh, achieve lateral connectivity? What types of uh, um, in-stream structures, whether they be undersized culverts or derelict dams, are creating longitudinal disconnections in our river systems, as well as how, have, how is our whole generation of stormwater in both our urban and agricultural settings changing the, te the temporal connectivity? Where do we still have the opportunity to reconnect those systems so that we might then you know, attain uh, the opportunity for these processes to play out. So between uh, understanding what's connected and disconnected and understanding the, <coughs> the processes that are occurring, we can then evaluate a whole set of uh, floodplain functions, 
almost all of which are, uh, you know, have been touched upon uh, in the conference so far and are critical to our aquatic, riparian, and floodplain uh, ecosystems. So, <clears throat> in terms of uh, data that we need to collect, uh, some of the uh, data sets that we simply did not have available to us uh, 20 years ago, uh, the, the detailed LIDAR data, uh, the land use land cover data, uh, some, some of the imagery that we can use now in, uh, from a remote sensing standpoint to understand uh, the connections or the lack of connections in these systems, between, especially between the, the river, its, river, its corridor, uh, its meander uh, area and its floodplain, as well as uh, riparian wetlands, is now something that we can accomplish. This map uh, is showing some of the initial analysis that the team has worked on to try to understand how much lateral space is remaining that's important for that equalization of energy in the system. Uh, what type of protection currently exists, which gets into that whole temporal component uh, of our conservation work, as well as uh, what is the condition of the riparian. All of these lateral connectivity uh, measurements then will, would be divided by the degree of vertical connectivity in the system, because a stream's vertical disconnection uh, really multiplies the impact of the loss of that lateral connectivity in our systems. So we'll be coming up with, you know, uh, uh, a whole systems level analysis of what is connected and what is the potential to reconnect to those systems over time. Field assessments are really still very critical. Uh, you know, I've seen an increasing trend where we try to do more and more with just remote sensing. Uh, I'm not a proponent of that. I really feel it's so important that we get out and we verify the connectivity of our systems uh, and that we uh, are, you know, looking at signs, uh, at the very least, of some of these fluvial processes, these scour and depositional processes that are so important to our aquatic ecosystems. But we also hope to use um, a combination of that data, you know, to, uh, to do some very detailed modeling of these processes, uh, looking within the stream channel and understanding the specific stream power and how that power is distributed through the system that's moving these materials. The movement of these materials is so critical, uh, not only in terms of creating, you know, habitat on those micro and meso scales, but it's, it's important in terms of reconnecting the river system over time. If you have a stream that is uh, deeply incised, cut down, disconnected from its floodplain, no longer spilling onto that floodplain during that flood condition, and, it, and that um, system, as the, the, I'm showing here in this one cross section with the extremely high stream power, is constantly moving all of the sediment and debris through the system because it's over energized then it's never going to build its bed back up. It's never going to reconnect to its floodplain um, and, and, and these functions that we are so important uh, will, will not be restored. So do, do the detailed modeling on a number of, of locations characteristic of different valley settings that allows us to not only understand uh, what is disconnected, but were we to reconnect um, that, that ecosystem, what types of processes might we restore? We're also looking at impediments. Uh, if we're going to start to come up with strategies uh, for restoring connections in, in our river systems, there's a whole different, there's a whole suite of different types of impediments to doing that. Uh, the undersized culvert it would, would be relatively easy uh, to replace and get longitudinal connectivity uh, to, uh, as compared to perhaps uh, buying out a, a set of houses in order to create enough uh, space for the appropriate meander geometry and slope and equilibrium conditions that we might get in another location. So understanding those impediments is really key. And this, is, this is really our, our ultimate uh, what I think of as our ultimate challenge is to take 
uh, our understanding of forms through connectivity, the fluvial processes that are occurring, and these impediments, and understand them at a scale that we would typically use to do uh, our work, uh, do a functional assessment uh, that, that might be achievable through making connections, and then finally to be able to place a value on that that's just, that really helps us work with landowners and communities to be able to do those co that connectivity work. Um, that's really, I think, one of the uh, biggest challenges that we as conservation uh, conservationists and, and resource managers have is we under we eventually you know get a pretty good understanding of the science, but communicating that. Uh, to uh, communities, to landowners, in a way that moves us towards, uh, if nothing else, just a, a passive, you know, uh, approach to restoration. Give the river room, and it'll fix itself. Uh, idea uh, that we we have the ability to generate interest. That there is an interest uh, that landowners and communities would have. So looking at these various values based on the functions. Uh, that that we might try to be that we might try to evaluate. We, you know, we're right now in in discussions with folks here on campus to bring more of the social scientists into this project uh, to uh, to understand different ways that we might uh, communicate the values of having uh, connected riverscapes, um, and and I'm 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 very excited about that. The, the possibility of that. So many of these projects that we're working on right now throughout our watersheds uh, would be would be more possible with with these partnerships. You know, the note I wanted to make here is is you know we 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 have a tremendous amount of effort going into restoring our longitudinal and temporal connectivity in the state of Vermont right now. We have programs to deal with with stream crossings. Uh, people were very excited about taking out derelict dams. We have a huge stormwater program that's gearing up. These are all positive things that are going to create connectivity. Where we really need to, to uh, focus our efforts, in, in my opinion, is the vertical and, long and lateral connectivity of our rivers. As more and more encroachments occur, and we are then forced to manage our rivers in this disconnected state, uh, we, we will never restore that lateral and, and vertical connectivity that's so important to tying the river to its floodplains, to its wetlands, and, be, and giving us the buffer uh, to, for these processes to create and maintain these habitats. So that's, that's one of the, I think, really key take homes, is that we have to gain an appreciation uh, that, that, we, that this uh, lateral connectivity, which is impossible without the vertical connection, is so important and that we have to be able to see something like that and not call it a disaster, but call it something that's really important and beautiful uh, towards uh, um, our, our aquatic ecosystems and our ability to adapt to uh, climate change in the future. Thank you.